Well, happy Easter, everybody. It is so good to see you guys here with us in Maryville. I want to look to the camera and tell everyone watching online, we're so glad that you're watching as well. And to everybody at our Bearden location, we are so glad that you are connecting this Easter as well. And if you didn't know, we're one church in two locations. We meet obviously here in Maryville, but also in Knoxville as well. And you know, I am just excited about the opportunity to worship and gather together today. Folks, the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive, right? We excited about that today. Praise God for that. And uh, I believe uh, I, there are many people here today, probably for the first time, or maybe it's been a uh, first time in a while. And I just want you to know that you are in uh, a, a place that is uh, welcoming and free to really discover who God is. I don't believe anybody's here by accident. I think there have been a series of events that have kind of orchestrated this moment, this day uh, for you to be here and, and really to experience what you are experiencing. And this is a place where you can ask questions and you can discover who God is. And I think for many of us, we, we kind of we kind of think that sometimes life is just about breathing and paying bills. <laughs> And that's how life kind of feels sometimes. But when we understand who Jesus is, we realize that he offers us not only forgiveness, but purpose. Not only purpose, but he offers us power to live in our daily life. And when we discover who Jesus is, that purpose, that power begins to live within us. And, and then everything begins and starts to make sense around us. And he gives, he gives purpose behind even some of the, all of the pain that we've gone through in our life. And so I'm glad that you're here. And I, I pray that today, my biggest prayer is that God would change your life and that some of you who have never committed your life to Christ, that today you would actually commit your life to Christ. And, and that choice is, is really yours. You, know, you, can, you can continue to live your life without Christ. You can continue to kind of do what you're doing. But if you do that, you're gonna continue to experience that, that, that sense that there is no purpose or there is no meaning in your life. You'll continue to experience that, that, that feeling of just having no peace in your heart. And, and, and what, what Christ does when we begin to understand who he is and we commit our life to him, all of that begins to decrease and that purpose and power then begins to fill our heart. And, and that's what I want you to experience today if you've never experienced that. Uh, you know, I love a good movie. I, I love a good story. And uh, every good movie, every good story has the protagonist, that is the good guy, the hero. And... Also, there's the antagonist, that's the bad guy, that's the villain. And if you were to list your top, you know, one, two, three movies of all time, uh, I guarantee you that movie would have that classic bad guy, the classic evil character, right? Every good story does. And in fact, let me give you a few examples. And this is for, you know, the, the, the older crowd, but, but this old movie like has stood the test of time. Uh, back in the day, it was good and you could watch it even today. And if you were to see this person's face, you know from the gate, <laughs> that's an evil person, right? The wicked witch uh, of the West, was it the West or was it the East? I don't know. The West, okay. So the Wizard of Oz, right? Obviously the look, the laugh, everything about her, the music behind when she's riding that bike or the broom or whatever it was like super evil, right? Now, how many of you guys are Harry Potter fans? Anybody at all? Okay, lots of Harry Potter fans. And you got, you know, this bad guy. <laughs> oh, applause for the bad guy. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to church. No, <laughs> you, you look at this guy. I've never actually seen the movie. He's the one of whom we do not speak. I do know that, right? And he's obviously a bad guy. He's got the look. He, I mean, the whole deal is pretty scary. I'm a little intimidated just standing up here with him. But, but that's kind of how villains are, right? They kind of look and feel like the villain. Now, uh, some of you guys are, are Batman fans. And so I'm a huge Batman fan from, from when I was a kid. And so this movie was one of those movies that was kind of dark. But when Heath Ledger, he, he's passed away, but what a great job he did in this, this, this movie. Like, 
Uh, this joker was like scary, evil, and we knew he was the bad guy, right? I mean, there's, there's no like, you know, mistaking that person. We can, we can really feel it. Now, how many of you guys are Marvel fans? I know there's some Marvel fans in the room. And so, you know, this guy, right? I mean, with the snap of his finger, he just wipes out half of the earth, right? I mean, that's a pretty evil villain, if you ask me. And so lots of bad guys up here, but I will tell you for me, uh, growing up in the 80s, there was one character that was the epitome of evil. Anybody with me on this one? I mean, in The Return of the Jedi, when I was a kid and he walks out with the Imperial March, dun, 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 dun. You're just like, ah! <laughs> you know, that's like, he, he's like the epitome of evil. And, and the whole story is, is pretty interesting when you kind of start to think about it as a, like, like, you know, as an older guy now, like I thought it was about, is Luke going to turn bad or is he going to stay good? And that whole battle with Luke, but, but really that's not what the story was about. The story is really about redemption. And the story is really about, is Darth Vader the epitome of evil going to be convinced by his son to turn to the good side? Right? And, and, and through the movie, you're just like, Luke, bro, it's not going to work. It's Darth Vader. He's evil, man. He's going to get you. Stay away from him. But he doesn't. He keeps fighting for his father. And you know the story. He, he saves Luke's life and then he kills the emperor and he, he turns to the good side. And it's like, whoa, that's incredible. Like as a kid, I'm watching this and, and it's like, what a, what a great lesson that, that sometimes the bad guy can choose to be the good guy. Sometimes the villain can actually become the hero. And if you think about it, that's a, a really, really important message for every single one of us today that we would understand that no matter who you are or what you've gone through, you have an opportunity to change the direction and the course of your life from this moment forward. We're gonna read in Matthew 27, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. We're gonna read the story of one of the greatest villains in the story of the gospel. And his name is Pilate. And we know he is an evil villain because he is a politician. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No further political jokes today, even though I would love to chime in with some one-liners. No, he is, not all politicians are bad, but he is uh, the governor. He's called the procurator of Judea at the time. So he was running the whole country and he reported to the emperor of Rome only. So he was a big deal and he had the power to release Jesus or he had the power to actually execute Jesus. And so uh, as we read this story, I want us to begin to think about what it really means to be a villain. Because I think you and I will be surprised by the simplicity of what makes a villain. And in fact, as we look to and at Pilate, I want you to ask this question, who is the real villain of Easter? Who's the real villain of Easter? Let's start in chapter 27, beginning in verse 11. Here we go. Now Jesus stood before the governor. This is the trial uh, as he stood before a pilot. And the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was uh, accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. The governor was greatly amazed by Jesus at this point. And so here's the, here's the deal, like Jesus is being asked by him, are you the king of the Jews? And, and his response is, you have said so. And so essentially Jesus is affirming that he is. And, and, and even on a deeper level, we know what he's uh, claiming is that he's the Messiah, that he is the son of God who was sent to save his people from his sins, from our sins. And so essentially though, as Pilate moves forward, Pilate's making a grave mistake and it, what's, it, it's what makes him a villain. 
And if we're not careful, if we don't, if we don't look through the lens of the gospel this morning, then we'll miss it as well. But, but here's the reality, if you wanna take some notes, Pilate didn't believe Jesus. That's essentially what makes him the villain. He doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't believe that Jesus is the son of God. And I know that there are people here this morning who would probably be in the same boat as Pilate right now. You think he doesn't really deserve to die. He's not necessarily a bad person, but you haven't actually believed and put your faith and hope in Jesus. He made several claims about himself, this one being one of them that Pilate denied, but he's also denying the other many, many statements that Jesus made about himself. Um, In John chapter 30, or chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said that I am God. He actually said that I and the Father are one. Now that's a strong statement when you think about it. And when you look at all the other world religions, no one, no leader of any other world religion made that claim. Muhammad didn't make that claim. Confucius didn't make that claim. No other uh, world religion, Buddha never made that claim, but Jesus made this claim. So he is either telling us the truth, which I believe he was, or he's the biggest liar in the history of the world and deserves hell more than any of us. And so we can't really come to Jesus and say, he's a good guy, but I'm just not gonna follow him. We can't really say, yeah, he's a good moral leader and and he said some cool things. And so I don't mind if people actually follow him or not. We either have to realize that he is either a liar or he is actually telling us the truth. And you and I have to decide whether or not we're gonna submit our life to him as God, or if we're just gonna ignore him. Jesus also said in John 14, six, I am the way, the truth and life. And no one comes to the father except through me. Now Jesus's message here is pretty clear. Like you can't mistake it. He's essentially saying, uh, despite what culture might teach us today, that all roads or all religions do not lead to heaven. All religions do not lead to God. And he's, he's making a very exclusive statement here. And he's saying that salvation, forgiveness of sin, heaven can only be experienced by being in a relationship with him. Now, again, he's either telling us the truth, which, which I believe that he is, or he's lying. Who do you say that he is? Jesus also made this claim in John eleven twenty four. 24. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So essentially Jesus is saying, yes, you're going to die physical death because of sin, we will die. Our bodies are breaking down. He says, yet though you die, yet shall you live. Why? Because he's the resurrection and he is the life. And so as we think about this, because we get to celebrate Easter today and that the tomb is empty, Jesus is saying, I rose from the grave, which means I am who I said I was. I was God. I was was perfect. I was sinless. I am the resurrection. I am the life. And so what he is saying is if we put our faith in him, Even though we die, we will live forever in heaven with him. I love this verse I wanted to show in in Romans 8, 11. It's one of the most powerful Easter verses in the Bible. And sometimes we, we sleep on it. Here's what it says. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. We have a mortal body right now, right? We we have this body that is breaking down and eventually we will all face the reality of death. And yet he says, "If, if, if, if he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead also gives life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells, in you. And so when we put our faith in Jesus, the spirit of God lives within us and he gives us life, which means if the spirit of God does not live in you today, then you are not experiencing life. 
And it is why you feel so broken so often. You can get busy in life and things can happen and time goes by fast. And when we're busy with kids and life and stuff, sometimes we don't think about the deeper things of life. And so, you know, months can go by. Uh, But then when something challenging comes into our life, that's when God often kind of pumps the brakes in our life and we slow down and it's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Like, this is heavy. And we want answers for the heaviness. And, and if we don't turn to Jesus for those answers, then we turn to a, a world that, that gives us a bunch of self-help and, and a bunch of ways to kind of numb the pain and just kind of eke our way through it. And we continually just kind of go through that cycle of just nonsense, nonsense, brokenness, brokenness, self-help, self-help. It never works. We never quite find peace until we come to Jesus. Pilate didn't believe in Jesus. Some of you came here today not believing in Jesus, but my prayer is that you'll walk away today actually putting your faith in him and committing your life to him today. In verse 14, it said that Pilate was amazed by Jesus. He was amazed at his demeanor and how he was handling the situation and and the statement that he just made to him. And yet Pilate still walked away from him unchanged. You see, you can be amazed by the gospel. You can be amazed by God. You can be amazed by creation. You can have that amazement and still walk away unchanged by God. You need an encounter with God. He changes you by giving you the spirit of God within your own soul. Chances are you didn't walk in here today thinking that you were the bad guy. (laughs) You didn't walk in here thinking you were the villain. We looked at all these pictures and it was obvious they are villains, right? Because they looked the part, they act the part, they sounded, the music behind them kind of gives it away. And so many of us, we just think, well, I know I'm not perfect, but you know, I'm not the evil person that's portrayed in some of these movies. I'm not that bad, am I? We all kind of think that way. We, you know, we don't, we don't look so bad. Maybe in the morning we look bad, but then after a shower and a brush, we kind of fix ourselves up. And so we don't tend to think of ourselves in this light, but the Bible actually paints a different picture. And it's it's a picture that we've got to understand about who we are. We've got to know who we are before God can actually begin to change us. And so this is what it says in Romans chapter three, verse 10. God says, there's no one righteous, not even one. (laughs) There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. Think about that for a minute. There's no one that's good. There's no one who understands. There's no one, not one person in the history of the world that seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. You see, when you look at the holiness of God, when you think about the holiness of God, when you read the Bible, especially if you read the Psalms and you begin to see the the holiness and purity and sovereignty and power of God, when you begin to think about that and he begins to speak to you and open up your eyes to understand who he really is, then it becomes clearer and clearer that I am unrighteous, that I'm not a good person, In fact, that I am a villain of God. The Bible says that before our faith in Christ, we're an enemy of God. The word of God teaches us that you're not just born a Christian. Uh, Just because your grandmother was a saint and she loved Jesus doesn't mean that you're going to heaven. (laughs) Like you have to make that decision. You have to experience that life change just like she did. Right, And so this is what the scripture teaches us. And so essentially what that means is your best day is still a bad day in God's eyes. The very best you could do is still a bad day in the eyes of God. And so what do we do with that? Sin deceives us, right? We think we're better than we actually are. And and that leads us to think that we don't really need God especially in our culture where we have resources and jobs that take care and provide for you know, our basic needs. And, and all of a sudden God becomes secondary. God becomes this you know, person that we need when someone, you know, or, or, or someone passes away or something like really, really bad happens. But 
outside of those moments, do we really need him? And sin blinds us to the reality and it's broken our relationship with our creator. There's no way for us to know God. There's no way for us to experience a relationship with him apart from Jesus. And, and you can't earn that. You can't just start living a better life and then God say, okay, yeah, okay, this guy's starting to get it. You can't, you can't live a certain way that God, you know, you get God's attention and he decides to love you more. You can't buy it. So it's not about how much money you can give. You can't earn it. God does this amazing thing. He sends Jesus into a broken, sinful world to save broken, sinful villains who chose to go our own way instead of follow his way. And so Jesus dies on a cross and he was taking my place. He's taking your place. He dies the death that you and I deserved and that death pays for our forgiveness. God couldn't just say, okay, Trent, you're forgiven. That would make him an unrighteous judge, an unrighteous God to just say, oh, okay, it's not that bad. Come on in. Like, wait, no, 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 no. Sin is evil. Sin breaks relationship. And you can't just smooth that over. Somebody had to pay for that. And it was either gonna be me or I was gonna trust in the death of Jesus as being that payment that gives me that forgiveness. And the same is true for each of us. And the good news is he offers that to you today. He offers forgiveness. He offers a relationship with him. He offers his spirit to dwell within you. And that is the good news of Easter. If Jesus didn't raise from the grave, then we're all wasting our time. But the truth of the matter is that he is alive, that the tomb is empty. And because of that, we have the ability through him to have forgiveness, to have hope, and to have a relationship with God. And in the Bible, when people put their faith in Jesus, it says that they are baptized. And in Acts 2, 41, it says, those who accepted his message were baptized. And baptism is, is, it doesn't save us, but it's a symbol. It's that outward symbol of the inward commitment that we have made. And so it's me saying that I'm gonna go public with my faith. I'm gonna let everybody know that I follow Jesus. And so, you know, we kind of, in our world we kind of mess up that whole thing and so people will you know baptize babies or pour water on their head and so we think that means something but nowhere in the bible does it say we're to do that everywhere in the new testament it says someone puts their faith in jesus and then they symbolize that faith by being baptized and some of you have maybe never done that you'll have the opportunity today to yes put your faith in jesus but then secondly just like in the new testament like Go ahead and take that step of baptism and, and follow him today. Some of you might say, well, yeah, man, I, I think I did give my life to Christ, but I've never been baptized. Or maybe I was sprinkled as a kid or baptized earlier and I kind of got it flip-flopped. And, and so you might say today, I want to take that step. And here's the great news. We've got shirts, we've got, you know, shorts, we got hair dryers. If you need a hair dryer. You know, we got everything that you need. We're, we're gonna, we're gonna video it and stream it online so that Aunt Flossie in California can watch it if you want her to. So there's really no, there's really no excuse to obey God today. And so we wanna give you that opportunity. But Pilate doesn't believe Jesus, right? That's the first thing that, that really makes him the villain of the story. And it makes us the villain of the story as well, but he's not done and truth is, Neither are we. Let's keep reading in chapter 27, verse 15. It says, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release uh, for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner, the notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him. So Pilate knew that the religious leaders brought Jesus uh, to be executed because of their envy of him. And so Pilate has a decision to make. Am I gonna do the right thing? Am I gonna follow the law? Or am I gonna make a decision based on a self, 
self-centered desire. And so this is a, this is a big one, right? Pilate makes a self-centered decision. He says, we can, we can you know, release Barabbas, who's a known murderer, or we can release this guy named Jesus, who obviously is innocent. But then the crowd starts chanting, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas. And so Pilate makes a decision and it's a self-centered decision. Why? Because he is more concerned about pleasing the people than he is about doing the right thing. He's more concerned about keeping his job and making people happy instead of doing the right thing. Now let's ask, who's the villain of Easter? You ever made a self-centered decision just trying to please the people around you, trying to get acceptance by friends, trying to get acceptance by the people at work, trying not to ruffle anybody's feathers and then deny and ignore the right thing? You see, every single one of us have done it. Pilate did not have the courage to do the right thing. And he made a self-centered decision. Here's the next thing that he did in verse 19. Besides this, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, right? That's, that's important. He's, he is the judge, right? He can release Jesus or he can execute Jesus. Why he's on the judgment seat? His wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. She calls him a righteous man. She believes he is a righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. So she had some kind of dream about Jesus. She believes he's a righteous man. And her warning, her wisdom to her husband is have nothing to do with him. Don't murder him. Don't execute him. Be good to him. All right, wives, be honest with me. Raise your hand if your husbands from time to time don't listen to you. That was quick. (laughs) Fastest response in the history of the church my wife's hand was the first one (laughs) she's like Trent you have two main problems number one you don't listen to me and number two well I forget what the second one was but (laughs) dad joke gotcha no I mean our wives aren't always right guys but a lot of times they are (laughs) And there's a lot of wisdom there. And so what Pilate is neglecting here, what he does is he ignores wisdom and he gives in to the peer pressure. And he ignores wisdom. Now here's the truth. Some of you have wise people in your life who are trying to coach you, encourage you, who are trying to lead you to live and do what God is asking you to do. But you just ignore them. And you just go to what you want and you go to what you, know, you think is right. Why? Because of friends, because of the mob, because of the crowd, right? I mean, our, our, our culture today is, is not any different, right? The mob mentality of, of if you go against what everybody, you know, popular culture says is right, you go against it, mob mentality rises up, what will you do? Do you listen to wisdom or do you give in to the crowd? You see, Pilate is the villain because he does exactly what you and I are faced with all the time. And so so I think every single one of us, man, let's think about this. Who's in your life right now? that has been saying the same thing God has been trying to teach you and you've been ignoring it. And you've been running from it. Proverbs 19, 20 says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Wow, what a, what a powerful voice that we would, we would listen to advice and accept instruction to gain wisdom in our life. Pilate was unwilling to heed the warning, but he's not done yet. Let's keep going. One more point here, verse 24 So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, right? He's gaining nothing. So he knows Jesus is innocent. He's trying to, uh, you know, lead the crowd to release Jesus, but he's gaining nothing from them. Rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and he washed his hands because the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. 
And all the people answered him, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, whipping him, delivered him to be killed, to be crucified. So Pilate is washing his hands here. It's a symbol of him saying, hey, this is on you guys. I didn't want this. It's all on you. But unfortunately, you can't do that in life. Like Pilate tried to escape responsibility. He had the control. He had the power. And he's trying to escape the responsibility and put it on other people. But every single one of us is responsible for our own sin. You can't blame mom and dad. You can't blame your your ex-wife or your ex-husband. You can't blame your children. You, you, You can't blame your circumstances. We live in a culture that tries to make it easy for us just to blame other people and that makes us feel better. But, but the reality is God's not fooled by that. Like he doesn't operate in that way. He holds every single one of us responsible for what we have done. See, the villain of the story is anyone like Pilate who doesn't believe in Jesus, who makes self-centered decisions decisions, who who ignores wisdom and caves into peer pressure and then tries to escape responsibility. And the reality is every single one of us, including me, are the villain. The DNA of the villain is right here in my own heart because of sin. The real villain of Easter is me. It's you. If we would have been there that day, just like Pilate, we would have tried to skirt the responsibility And some of us would have even yelled out, crucify him. But the great news is, even though Pilate said crucify him, it was also God's plan. It was God's plan that he would die. It was God's plan and actually his purpose for being here that he would die and raise from the grave. Why? because he loves you. Why? Because he wanted to give you an opportunity to have your sins forgiven and a relationship with him. Jesus willingly goes to the cross. He's not forced to go to the cross. He's not, you know, uh, manipulated to go to the cross. No, he wants to go to the cross as difficult as it was because he came as the savior of the world. And here's the great news. You have an opportunity today, right here, right now, to commit your life to Christ. And what's happening for some of you watching, for some of you here in the room with me is that you're feeling God draw you into your, unto himself. And so there's some conviction there. There's, there's a feeling there that you're, you're beginning to experience. And there's this thing that, that you feel like, yes, God is drawing me. And at the same time, all of the, that DNA of the villain is gonna run through your, your head and you're gonna potentially say things like, well, yes, but I just need to work harder. Yes, I, I, I'm not good enough yet. Let me, let me do a little bit more. That voice in your head is gonna say, hey, you can fix this on your own. And so every one of us is just gonna begin to kind of have this internal battle. But, but let's be clear, Romans 10, 9, says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Some of you have never done that. Some of you have never committed your life to Christ. You've never admitted that you are the villain, that you are a sinner in need of forgiveness. And that's step one. And so you'll have the opportunity to do that. And when you do that, immediately, it's not like you have to you know, do X, Y, and Z after that to, to get God to love you. Like, no, immediately the Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells within you and saves you. And, and then as the scriptures taught us that your next step would be to get baptized. And so we wanna do that today. And I wanna give you the opportunity to do that today. And that opportunity is, is right here, right now. Would you bow your heads with me? All over the room, people dealing with various issues. And so I would just ask that you would just respect this moment and the quietness of this moment. If you'd like to give your 
life to Christ, if you wanna receive his forgiveness, commit your life to him, you just make this prayer your prayer. You make this commitment between you and God. Just confess to God right now. God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me and that he rose from the grave and I need him right now. I commit my life to you. All over the room, every head bowed, hearts open, eyes closed. How many would say, Trent, that's me today. That's what I just did. I just prayed that. I mean that all over this room. If that was you, would you just lift up your hand so I can see who you are? Anybody at all, just lift it up high and say, that was me today. I see one. Anybody else say, that, that's me. I just prayed. I see two, one up in the balcony, three. Praise God, sir. Keep, keep your hand up. Praise God. Anybody else? I just prayed. Praise God. You can put your hand down. Now, how many would say, Trent, I, I believe I've done that, but I have never been baptized. Again, show of hands. Lift your hand up high. Say, that's me. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. You can put it down. Here's what we're going to do. Are you ready to make that decision? Ready to take that step? Why wait? Why put it off? Easter 2022. Let's do it. Let's take that stand. Let's have the courage to take that stand for Christ today. And so I'm gonna count to three. If you wanna make that commitment, if you wanna go get baptized, I just wanna encourage you to stand to your feet. Ready? One, two, three. Stand up all over the room. That's what you want. (laughs) Praise God. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like the video and leave a comment. And we also encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss a post from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, just head to our website by going to foothillschurch.com or by clicking the link in the description below.